This is the Invincible Podcast on TV Podcast Industries. We're talking about Invincible Season 2, Episode 2. In about six hours, I lose my virginity to a fish. It's the Lizard League, sir. You called me back for the Lizard League? They've hit a bio-research lab outside of Dallas. How? We got King Lizard rotting in a prison cell. Uh, It appears that Supreme Lizard has seized control in his absence. (sighs) Send in the Guardians. Are, Are you sure they're ready? If they can't take down the Lizard League, they'll never be ready. Welcome back, fellow Guardians, to the Invincible Podcast on TV Podcast Industries. We are on to episode two of season two of Invincible. In the best-named episode so far, in about six hours, I lose my virginity to a fish. I am one of your hosts, Derek, and we have a very special guest um, for this (laughs) podcast. John is joining me for this podcast. I know you said you wanted to maybe hop in for an episode of Invincible, but I don't think you thought you were going to be a replacement for Chris and a last minute one at that. No, no, I didn't. But welcome uh, and hello, fellow Guardians. Yes, a new voice, a voice that knows nothing about Invincible, although I have enjoyed watching it, but uh, I can't say... um, I have too many notes on this episode, Mm -hmm. uh, but enjoying the ride of Invincible. And you have watched every single episode. I have, absolutely. Yeah, and a great title for the the episode, although it doesn't transpire. It doesn't, it doesn't, but he does believe that's what's going to happen to him. (laughs) Definitely. He does think that is going to happen. But for... But for those of you who don't know John, if you haven't uh, heard him, because you may just be listening to our Invincible podcast, John is our main podcaster who's been on the podcast for TV Podcast Industries for almost 10 years now, uh, just over 800 episodes, John, yes, um, at this stage. It is. Yeah. So hello, everyone, mm-hmm. uh, fellow Guardians. Uh, it's the first time I've ever said that. Uh, yeah. So yeah, really good to be on the, the show, and hopefully I can contribute something for Invincible. <laughs> well, you are a lead podcaster, of course, as well, on all the boys' podcasts and on Gen V, you're the, my co-host on there as well. So uh, it's interesting to be uh, introducing you on this podcast, because that does feel weird after this amount of time. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a little strange how you've right. introduced me. I'm going to stop uh, doing that. <laughs> uh, but I w- do want to go into a little bit of news uh, this week uh, for Invincible, because uh, there's lots and lots of stuff coming coming out as the uh, first couple episodes of the show have just, have just aired. So uh, some interesting news uh, in other realms of Invincible. Uh, first up, Invincible Presents Atom Eve. The game is coming to PC on November 14th, just next week. It's kind of a visual novel with some kind of light turn-based role-playing uh, parts of the game. It looks kind of interesting. It's like it's like a graphic novel come to life. Excellent. Um, where you Good make stuff. your choices as you go through. So it looks really interesting and again, focused on Adam Eve. Uh, she's had her own um, her own movie this year, the full hour-long episode of, of Atom Eve. Um, so now they have a game coming out next week that you can buy for PC. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah, there is, just try it. Yeah. I have to say, there is also some more gaming news for the Invincible series, mm-hmm. uh, because Omni-Man is coming to Mortal Kombat mm-hmm. right up his street with a bit of punching, Absolutely. spine ripping, mm-hmm. head, well, decapitating, mm-hmm. you name it. Uh, yes, he is coming to Mortal Kombat on November the 9th, yep. where he will feature some of the massive moves from the tv series and the comic as well yeah so yeah really interesting stuff i did like the one where he holds the opponent uh to the oncoming uh underground train yes sure. just like he did to mark in season one Indeed. in chicago so uh so quite cool to see that brought to life it is definitely taking references from the cartoon yeah. series exactly as you've seen the performance there of omni man last season and it is also voiced by J.K. Simmons, so you'll yeah, hear so J.K. Really Simmons' good. voice there. Yeah, yeah. and of course, uh, with the end of the little snippet around Omni Man, mm-hmm. we do have uh, another character uh, coming into Mortal Kombat as mm-hmm. well. For uh, one of the characters we've covered on our The Boys podcast with Homelander. That's right. So yes, that will be depraved, I guess. Oh, I, I'm really looking forward to uh, to getting these two characters and yeah. seeing Omni Man versus Homelander in a video game that's going to be so cool interesting i've always been a fan of mortal kombat i've always picked up the games don't normally pick them up on day of release because there's so much extra content i eventually just get it 
marked down with everything involved in it, everything included in it. So uh, really looking forward to playing that in a couple of months' time, probably for me. But uh, but check it out. Uh, coming out, available on PlayStation and, uh, and Xbox on the 9th of November for Omni Man. It certainly is. Also coming out weekly will be our Invincible podcast yes. as well for at least the, this week and the next two weeks mm-hmm. for the first four episodes that are released. Yeah. Uh, so you can pop on over fellow guardians to our website at tvpodcastindustries.com where you can subscribe to any flying or grounded superhero podcast player of your choice. Uh, of course, we do love to get your thoughts, theories, observations, mm-hmm. uh, and comments on all things to do with Invincible. Uh, so please send in those by email to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com or over on our Facebook group. You can join us there where we put a spoiler post up each and every week on the Invincible episodes. Mm-hmm. Uh, just head on over to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash TV podcast industries. Absolutely. Uh, now, as we are recording in advance, we mentioned this last week, uh, we have our feedback for episode one, which we'll talk about later on uh, in this episode. And we'll talk about your feedback on episode two. Once you send it into us, we'll talk about that on episode three. Uh, great stuff. Let's get on with the discussion about uh, Invincible season two, episode two. Yes. Derek, who gave us this episode? Well, the show, of course, is created by Robert Kirkman, Corey Walker, and Ryan Otley from their comic book, Invincible. Uh, The supervising director, once again, for this episode is Dan Duncan, and this episode was written by Matt Lambert. Uh, He's previously written nine episodes of the TV show Into the Badlands and an episode of the Netflix smash hit, Wednesday. Oh, excellent stuff. Yeah, Yeah. really enjoyed Wednesday. Yeah, there's a little dark twist to that show that I really liked. Definitely. Uh, really enjoyed that. The director for this episode is Ian Abando. Uh, he's been an animator and storyboard, storyboard artist on lots of animated kids' movies, including Dis- Despicable Me 2 and 3. But this is his first episode of Invincible. Uh, he has also worked on nine episodes of 2017 Spider-Man animated series. The reason I mention that is because last week, the director of that episode had done 26 of the 52 episodes, I think it was, or 36 of the 52 episodes. So uh, drawing on uh, people who've worked on Spider-Man before, a superhero series, and moving them on to uh, Invincible, another sort of superhero series. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, I like that. Excellent. John, do you want to tell us what they gave us with your first synopsis for an Invincible episode for Invincible Season 2, Episode 2, In About Six Hours, I Lose My Virginity to a Fish? Sure. While his classmates attend their graduation from Reginald Vell Johnson High School, Mark battles Dr. Seismic. The Doctor is atop the Washington Memorial and wants to return all of the stolen minerals to the Earth, including the Memorial. Mark eventually beats him and his Magnemite henchmen, but the Memorial is halved in size, but all is not lost as Mark makes it just in time to graduate with his friends. With their summer now free, Samantha takes back her mantle of Atom Eve and goes to help rebuild Chicago. She cuts through the red tape and uses her powers to rebuild an apartment block and build a new playground that the city officials had never allowed due to planning permission. Later, as Samantha visits her parents and learns that her father has lost her job, she tries to use her powers to solve their problems by creating a golden apple they can trade for money. But her angry father wouldn't accept the gift, telling her all the repairs she made in Chicago failed, until she learns that she has to have the actual knowledge, not just use her powers, her father forbids her to return. Meanwhile, Mark is sent to Midnight City by Cecil to locate a new vigilante who has called themselves after the murdered vigilante Darkwing. He finds Darkwing's former sidekick Nightboy, angry that Omni-Man killed his former mentor. He wants Mark to pay for his father's actions. He sends Invincible to the Shadow World, but Mark threatens the new Darkwing, knocking him out and bringing him back to Cecil. But it's not over for Mark, as he also has to face the Queen of Atlantis, following his father's murder of her husband, Aquarius, as they have threatened to destroy the eastern seaboard of the USA. Traditions of the Atlanteans state that Mark has to marry the fish-like queen, but there are new traditions in place, as Invincible has to fight the monster of the deep. With a little help from Cecil, Invincible frees himself, but as he escapes, the monster begins to attack and kill the Atlanteans. Mark cannot leave them to be killed, and beats the sea creature back to the depths, releasing him from his obligation to Atlantis. 
Elsewhere, months after NASA astronaut Russ Livingston was replaced by a shape-shifting Martian, he is terrified he'll be found out. But after getting a leave of absence to pull himself together, the alien sees the success of Martian Man and joins the new Guardians of the Globe as a new hero, the Shapesmith. With his help, the Guardians beat the mediocre villainous team of the Lizard League, who change leadership once again. In another dimension, the Angstrom Levy captured a mark whose father is beaten by the humans of that Earth. He learns how they won and leaves that mark with a female Cecil and Donald to punish him for his crimes as he jumps to another dimension. Ooh, well done, John. Thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, these these episodes of Invincible are really, like, packed mm-hmm. with a lot of stuff. I, I'm it's guessing like different sort of comic issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it can be quite hard to figure out what's going on if you're just jumping into it. Yeah. Because there's a lot going on that seems to some extent, a little disconnected if you haven't really read the comics and so on, but it is absolutely rammed with information mm-hmm. and fun as well. So, I, yeah, I thought this was a, a really good episode, uh, and I, I'm really enjoying just the animation anyway. I love season one, and so far, you know, this is, yeah, just the second episode, mm-hmm. but it's got a really intriguing sort of kickoff point to it so yeah. i'm really enjoying it absolutely and one of the one of the things i really enjoy about robert kirkman's uh storylines is what he does is set up something and then pay it off you know months months down the line in his comic books and um, this seems to be the same with invincible chris is our invincible fan who's read all the comic books uh but it's it is definitely what he did within walking dead where he'd set something up and then it would come back yeah. a couple of years later it would suddenly pay off um so what we see here is a couple of things that have happened in this episode, which are connecting back to season one and will probably pay off at the end of season two or into season three. But they're here because it's building to something. It's always elements in the background that are building to things, you know, but there is absolutely tons that are going on. The yeah. way we talk about our episodes, as usual, John, you'll be used to this. We talk about our major points or major moments from the episode uh, that we think stood out to us. But there's always little things that are in these episodes, particularly because they're so crammed that we may miss out on. So uh, so let's just try and make sure we cover as, as much as we can uh, from the episode. And I do want to start out with our first point, the return of Dr. Seismic. Absolutely. Um, what an the geologist character. superhero. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I love crap superheroes, mm-hmm. and he is by far and away just perfect for the role. He is. Yeah. He really is. I, I love this new idea that he's come back with. We saw him uh, <laughs> last uh, last season. We saw him fighting uh, on Mount Rushmore with uh, with Mark. Yeah. Uh, he destroyed quite a lot of it last season as well. Uh, this time he's returned with his new Magnemite uh, warriors at, at his side, which... It doesn't take long for Mark to beat. He does get, of course, the crap kicked out of him because that's what happened yeah, to Mark Yeah, and the memorial, uh, the Washington Memorial does get fairly um, sort of messed up, really. It certainly does. But the idea that's inside Dr. Seismic's head that he's going to return every mineral the humans have taken from the planet Earth back to the planet, um, including everybody's house and everybody's shop and every building that's out there, starting here with the Washington Memorial, it's just ridiculous, <laughs> it's but very so funny. It's so awful. Yeah, it, it's you can it's, keep the houses made of wood. I love yeah, that exactly. Well. Yeah. <laughs> it's so kind of stupidly good. Mm-hmm. It's like it. It's kind of the eco warrior gone mental. I'm returning it to the earth. Uh, all this stone that's been used. Uh, yeah. like it's almost why do you exist? But. Mm-hmm. Why not as well? Like, it is so good. I love the fact as well, Dr. Seismic, but he's not a professor. Yeah. All, you know, all that kind of element to it. Because he hasn't taught, so he's not a professor. No, he exactly. It's just so good. <laughs> um, and I, I like the fact that this is keeping Mark from his graduation mm-hmm. ceremony. So, you know, you, you're kind of flitting back to the graduation ceremony where you've got Samantha, Amber, and William. Yes. And, you know, just wondering where he is. Um and yeah, I just kind of like this, you know, the reason for him not being there is because he's had to fight and um, just kind of the crappiest supervillain ever mm-hmm. with kind of an agenda that Mark's probably not too fussed about other than that he's destroying central Washington mm-hmm. in the process. Um, I just kind of like, it's almost like he shouldn't bother. Uh, but it's again, it's going back to the fact that you know he wants to help he wants mm-hmm. to, in a sense, that inner guilt for what happened with Omni Man and Cecil, you know, is still dubious about whether they can control him if he went rogue again. So yeah. Yeah. I guess is giving him 
a few more sort of low level, not that important missions, which hence uh, the return of Dr. Seismic exactly. and his kind of pointless plan really yeah yeah it's never <laughs> he's never going to succeed with that one at all is he um but you're right there's the, there is that kind of part of it with cecil where we find it a little bit later on when he's confronted by mark's mom debbie about mark being back on the front lines that she doesn't want her son hurt of course you know he's not ready for this yet he's still just a kid and cecil's kind of going but you know i'm only giving him jobs that aren't dangerous this isn't a dangerous job yeah. going up against seismic mark is so powerful he is invincible um he's not going to be taken out by someone like uh like seismic but it's still quite tough at oh, times absolutely you know the the um the magnemites uh you know at one point they were certainly had the the upper hand yeah just for a very brief moment but yeah. you were like going okay is this where Dr. Seismic becomes an, a legit a super villain mm-hmm. that he has to worry about? But Not no. this time. Not no. this time. <laughs> Excellent stuff. Yeah, but Mark does beat him by punching his way all the way up through the Washington Monument, knocking the top off it, and then he tells Cecil, well, I could pull it back out of the ground. It's looking pretty bad. I could pull it back out of the ground. And <laughs> Cecil's like, no, no, we'll just get the cleanup crew to do it. You've done You've done what we need you to do. Go back and have your graduation, basically. <laughs> uh, so really like that. Um, but it is great to see Dr. Seismic back. It is good to see all these characters again, even the worst characters from season one. Great to see them back in season Absolutely, two. And, you know, yeah. just little appearances from them. It keeps, you know, it keeps um, them interesting as well and seeing what the, what they're doing. So, uh, so good to see a moment with Dr. Seismic here. Uh, I'm going to move on to p- point number two, because as Mark goes back, graduates from high school, a big moment in anyone's life, as they say. But Mark has kind of moved on and in his own mind. He's already matured. He's way beyond high school. We saw that he's going off to college with Amber. Uh, next year but there's a moment here where we have um all of his friends together at adam eve's place samantha amber and william and mark are talking about their plans for the summer i just thought it was a really funny moment when we have william uh mark's best friend who's always trying to get mark to uh take him on flights around the city and mark's kind of refuse now He's much more serious as a superhero yeah and william's entire plan for the summer is to find the trashiest of reality shows and watch it twice <laughs> that's it that's yeah. his whole plan uh, amber is going to be uh, burying herself in um in uh local uh elections i guess uh for the comp troller yes. that's her that's her plan for the summer uh everybody the says it's so boring <laughs> yes yeah everybody yeah. telling her it's the most boring thing to do with your summer and a bigger part of the story really is Samantha is going to take back up her mantle as Adam Eve and go off and help in Chicago. And yeah. she does apologize to Mark, but um, since that's obviously quite a sore point for him, but she's going to be going off to Chicago to help people out there, use her powers, restore uh, p- places for people to live. So we see that story play out here. We see her using her superpowers um, to fix up a, an apartment block and get people able to move back in there. Yeah. And then set up a playground um, that they've been trying to get. So she does great stuff. But this is a Robert Kirkman story, so you yeah. can't have nice things in a Robert Kirkman well, story. Well, that's it. It's like, it all just seems so lovely. Mm-hmm. It's kind of, yeah, let's just wipe away the red tape. You know, mm-hmm. we've got people housed again. But I love the revelation that the reason why nothing was done to repair that was because the ground was too unstable. Exactly. And in fact, the people almost died again Mm -hmm. uh, because of the building kind of subsiding, collapsing again. Uh, And this all plays out with her father as well as she's back home. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, and I mean, like you think about it, it, this is cool. Okay, you know, I could just create golden apples all the time and I'm a millionaire or Mm -hmm. something. Uh, But... Like her dad's point is it's all too easy just to say my superpowers will be able to fix that. The problem is it needed more than just what she did. Absolutely. It, you know, you need ne- to be a civil engineer and an architect exactly. to build a building. You can't just uh, click your fingers and uh, make it look look like a building, <laughs> which is effectively what, uh, uh, what Adam Eve did. And if we thought that her father was bad in the first season and oh, in the Adam Eve movie, um, think about what's happened to him here. His head office has been destroyed in the battle that Mark had with uh, with his dad, with Omni-Man, um, which has led to him losing his job. And he's now working in Bergamart, blaming people with superpowers for it, which includes his own daughter. 
um, yeah. who, in his mind, is taking the easy way out, is using her powers rather than getting training, rather than getting a job like he had to to work for. So he has become even more of an a-hole in these scenes. You see his poor his poor wife who tries to reach out to her daughter, Samantha, telling her, you know, I'd like to see you. But underneath it all, finding it very difficult to survive on the kind of wages he's bringing home now and keeping the upkeep on their house, that kind of stuff. So Samantha knows there's something wrong here with her mom, but she can't get it out of her and only finds out afterwards in the worst way from her father who's telling her, until you learn, you need to develop the skills to use your powers or develop some skills and get a real job, you can't come back home to this house. Yeah, I mean, it's just the great Kirkman thing that Mm -hmm. he does, which is to say, you know, everything else, they just do whatever they do and everything's back to normal. Yeah. This is the aftermath. This is, it's not as easy as just using your powers. Absolutely. Which, you know, her father has that point, really. Mm-hmm. You know, he makes that valid point. He is an a-hole, absolutely. Yep. Um, I don't know whether I would have uh, p- turned my nose up at the golden apple, however. Mm-hmm. Um, all the groceries and everything else that she was willing yeah. to sort of just bring out of thin air. Yeah. But nonetheless, it's like, you know, I guess that's his prize. That's his 100%. position. So, yeah. yeah, really a strange and kind of relationship here between this family. And mm-hmm. even though they at least do kind of talk to one another, even though it's not pleasant, mm-hmm. but it's kind of like it's a real tense family atmosphere here that really comes through and i mean ultimately she is kind of banished from Mm -hmm. the house until she kind of in a sense it's like him saying until you grow up Mm -hmm. uh but we'll have to see how that plays out you know i'm not entirely sure where this is going it feels very different to a lot of the other stuff i mean i do like with mark and his mom their relationship Mm -hmm. and so on it's interesting it'll be interesting just to see where this goes and what it's to do. But I mean, as you say, it's coming through from the, uh, Atom Eve, uh, spin off. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's an interesting sideline, I think, here. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're because kind of, she's kind of yeah. taken herself out of all of that superhero thing. Mm-hmm. And because we see them in her treehouse, you yeah. know, it, she, she, she's kind of wants to be a part of herself. So, yeah. um, yeah. I guess it's looking more at the character of Atom Eve and, and what mm. she's doing. Exactly, exactly. She wants to stick away from that idea that she has to just go out and fight supervillains and and uh, and beat up people that are robbing banks, that kind of stuff. She wants to use her powers to bring joy to people. And of course, as I say, it's a curtain show. Uh, can't can't get away with it that easily. I doubt you'd ever have the Avengers rebuilding uh, someone's house and then it falls down on top of them and, and could potentially have killed them. <laughs> I don't think that's the way it works. So uh, Kirkman, of course, having his own uh, spin on that, which I really like. Will we move on to point number three, John? Yes, uh, Mark pays for his dad's mistakes. I love how they've incorporated this into the second season. Um, this is all paying off from the big reveal in the first season of uh, Omni-Man um, killing all the members of the Guardians of the Globe uh, that he could get his hands on. Uh, anybody that he could kill, he does kill. Um, leading on from last week, we saw Red Rush's wife, who uh, Red Rush, of course, also killed by Omni-Man. We saw his wife uh, coming in to talk to Debbie about how much her life has changed after um, he killed all of the Guardians of the Globe. This episode, we have two different people who've been massively affected by the murder of uh, the 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 Guardians of the Globe. First off, we have Mark going to Midnight City, uh, being sent to Midnight City by uh, Cecil because there has been the reappearance of Darkwing, this world's version of Batman, and uh, Midnight City being yeah. this world's worth of version of Gotham. Uh, I do love uh, some of the jokes in here about uh, about this city, the idea that it was uh, it's under a spell, so the minute you arrive into it, it's always nice. <laughs> so uh, a, a great explanation for why in DC, Gotham's world is always a dark world, uh, fill, filled with the dark night. So uh, here in this world, we have uh, their version of that of that vigilante Darkwing here, uh, living in the darkness at all times. But it turns out that it's actually Darkwing's former sidekick, not a sidekick, we were partners, um, nice boy uh, who's taken on the mantle of Darkwing and, and trying to live up to the legacy left behind by Darkwing. Yeah, I mean... Again, Invincible dispatches him pretty quickly, you know, and, mm. but I, I like how that kind of almost mystical element came in here mm-hmm. where, you know, it, it certainly puts him 
off balance, I think, in, in that moment. I, I love the Batman references. I love, yeah, we, I wasn't a psychic. I, I was a partner, you yeah. know, really playing into the Robin and Batman uh, element of this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I kind of like how, you know, he's paying for the crimes of his father and, and the murders that he did there with the original Guardians. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, like you say, it's just how this is all going to play out. Mm. Um, because he brings him back to uh, Cecil, so yeah, you know, is that for him to kind of try and enroll him into the new Guardians? Is mm-hmm. that just to lock him up? You know, what kind of, you know, the the menace that he's been doing? If he was, you know, the partner, the sidekick of Darkwing, you know, why is he suddenly gone rogue? Mm-hmm. Or was it just to take someone who had a vendetta against Mark off the board because that would ultimately, um interrupt affect any missions that he would have to go on yeah, uh, to Cecil. So yeah. it's kind of an interesting one. While I wasn't entirely sure why it was happening. Yeah. It would be I, interesting to see why this is or whether mm-hmm. it was just the setup ultimately for the bigger Atlantean one uh, where Mark managed to still keep um, hold of his aquatic cherry. <laughs> well, I suppose one of the things about it is that Cecil is saying this person is pretending to be Darkwing. We know Darkwing's dead. Can you go and check and make sure he hasn't come back from the dead or something? You know, that's that's part of it. But more interestingly in the battle itself is the threat from um, Darkwing 2, uh, as, the, as he's called in the comic books, uh, to Mark where he's saying to him, you did all this, you're your father's son. Yeah. And Mark tries to protest against it, saying, I'm nothing like him. I'm I'm a human. Um, I'm half human, at least. Um, I'm a hero, not like my father. And then when Mark is sent to the shadow world by uh, Darkwing, to this uh, other dimension almost, that it's, is there in uh, in Midnight City. Yes, he Mark, is threatening. Yeah, he pushes back against against um, Darkwing to saying to him, I am my father's son and I will kill you just like my father. Do you, do you doubt that I will do that? So Mark uses the, um, impression, I suppose, that Darkwing 2 has of, uh, Omni-Man in order to get out of the situation. So he is using that connection and yeah. how scared someone could be of someone that murdered their mentor. But I love this conflict within Mark that, you mm. know, he is worried about it, but will there come a point where he accepts it? Mm. You know, we haven't seen Omni-Man return back yep. to Earth yet. But what will happen when he does? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, at the end of season one, with him saying, you know, you're my father, with his face caved mm-hmm. in by his father, yeah. then it's like, you know, he obviously loves him. So this inner turmoil, this conflict about, you know, whether he's going to turn evil. And I mean, it's, it's that classic superhero tale. Mm-hmm. But it, you know, it's, it's his inner turmoil... It's Cecil's turmoil and, and doubts about whether he should be even bringing bringing him back into the fold. Mm-hmm. It's the doubts, the perceptions from Darkwing Two, as well as the Queen of Atlantis. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's all down to the reputation of his father that he's having to deal with, to live with, and in a sense, fight against. Uh, whether that will be successful yeah. is something. To, to be found. Yeah, and it is interesting that Cecil did say that to Debbie, as we mentioned earlier on, that he's not going to send Mark on any uh, very, very dangerous missions. Yet here, when he goes to Midnight City, he gets sent into the Shadow World. That could be very dangerous yeah. for, for Mark. Um, and then the second uh, mission that he sent on is going down to the Queen of Atlantis. And I love this from Cecil, where he's kind of going, well, sorry, but the tradition is that um, since uh, Omni-Man killed uh, her husband, you have to get in and marry her. But it's just ceremonial. <laughs> it's just ceremonial. It doesn't really matter at all. Uh, just go on, go on ahead, Dan. Yeah, like, I've got a girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, and Mark's kind of like going. Um, do I have to? But he gets down there and learns that uh, there's been a lot of development uh, there. And um, the joke here is that uh, Aquarius, who was the member of the Guardians of the Globe, uh, who went up there, just was messing about, uh, poncing around in his superhero costume, while she actually ran all of Atlantis and changed all of those stupid laws that meant that she would have to have. Her her husband replaced if he died. Yeah, so I, I uh, love so that. she'd been the real leader for the last decade. Yeah, so. I, I love that. I loved how it was like, you know, it's, oh, boys with toys. He did. He just went off and played around. Mm-hmm. I was running this whole civilization. Exactly. Yeah, really like that. I love the battle as well, ultimately, with the change in the tradition mm-hmm. where, 
it's almost like the creature from the deep has that kind of angular fish uh-huh. uh, element to it where this little thing pops up out of the depths <laughs> and it's yeah. like Mark's kind of hugging it and it's just really something on the forehead yeah. of the creature from the deep. I love um, that it's making noises like a squeaky toy and yeah, Mark's exactly. going, have I done it? Have I won? Do I win? Do I get out of here? <laughs> exactly. And then you see the monster it's is al- like, oh, that makes sense. Exactly. Yeah. It's almost like he's nobbling his head, mm-hmm. you know, sort of in a... In a um, in a neck lock, you know, yep. and uh, I kind of I love this. I love then the fight because I mean this monster seemed genuinely powerful, mm-hmm. and uh, ultimately it's kind of like Cecil saying get out of there. Mm-hmm. But again, it's to the point with uh, around whether he is Omni Man. Yes, Omni Man with his cover would have saved the Atlanteans as well. Mm-hmm. So possibly Mark doing it does that show that he's better than his father? It's it's whether he's covering something up, you know. I'm I'm almost wondering because yeah. I don't really know these comics uh, very well. But mm-hmm. is it almost like a trigger? If he is Viltrumized, is it some kind of genetic thing that will trigger on, uh, you know, or something like mm-hmm. that that will make him become the authoritarian aggressor that they are uh, across the the galaxy. Yeah, so, it, it is interesting. I do wonder if Omniwan would have gone back and helped the Atlanteans if he'd been in this situation. He probably wouldn't have been because he knows his powers better and he's, he's, he's stronger than Mark, as we saw uh, in that big battle at the end of Season 1. So if he'd been sent on this mission by Cecil, he may have just taken the the guide from Cecil to get out of there and just gone and got and allowed them to take care of themselves because he wouldn't have been thought of badly by Cecil. He got out of there. He That's took true, the order yeah. and left. Whereas Mark here can't possibly leave. What we see is the, uh, the creature from the deep, uh, goes after and starts eating and killing all of the Atlanteans. They don't have any control over him at all. So Mark has to go back and, uh, and save them. So yeah. And the, mm. yeah, no. So I mean, I, I, I like this. It's all playing into that kind of feel of, you know, Mark having to deal with the sins of his father, Mm -hmm. effectively. Absolutely. Um, But that's kind of the big central part of Mark's story in this episode. So there's a couple of other twists and turns in the episode that I really want to talk about. Yes, Uh, point four. Yeah. The Shapesmith. You know, I found this story so much fun. Yeah. Russ Livingston, the astronaut who was up on the planet with Mark, went to save uh, Mars, uh, save all the NASA, NASA astronauts that were up there from the uh, alien race that was infecting the Martians up there, and they were shape-shifting. We saw a little nod at the end of that episode that um, Russ had had potentially been taken over by one of these uh, shape-shifting aliens and now we see uh, them back at a debrief the four uh, astronauts uh, <laughs> back at the debrief uh, telling nasa effectively about these shape-changing aliens if they get back to earth we are screwed we need to sort this out why don't you send mark back up there why don't you send invisible back up there to kill them all destroy that race because if they come to earth we're screwed and russ in the corner kind of going Pretend, still pretending to be human, hoping not to be found out about it, and then saying he needs to go to the ejection room to urinate, something something along those lines. So he's not even able to speak like a normal human. He's still learning everything about the body, everything about what's going on. But it's the same with his landlady as well. Mm-hmm. He, you know, he's not paid the rent because he doesn't know that he should be doing that. Exactly. And she goes, "You need to give it me by the end of the week, or or you're out." And he's mm-hmm. kind of like just doesn't compute with him exactly. at all. Yeah. Uh, so, I, yeah, I like this, dare I say, it, fish out of water, yeah. a Martian out of Mars. You mm-hmm. know, I kind of really enjoyed that. And I love just the the little hint, you know, that, that glimmer of connection that he feels he could belong here mm-hmm. uh, where he sees this anniversary TV special of Martian Man. Mm-hmm. Um, and so... Another one of the Guardians of the Globe yeah. murdered by uh, by Omni-Man. And so, you know, he, he tosses down to, to join the new Guardians of the Globe uh, mm-hmm. as Shapesmith. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I like that. And the fact that he takes the shape of Rexplode uh, when he gets there, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, Rex, <laughs> Rex going... Not this again. I can't handle another person taking on a shape of one of us again. Uh, really good fun. Uh, also, what's great fun here is the the Lizard League. Uh, oh, this absolutely, absolutely useless version of, I guess, Hydra. Yeah, um, that's exactly what I thought. This yeah. is Hydra. Yeah, it, uh, the, it is. The voice acting for the the new leader of uh-huh. the Lizard League, who ultimately gets shot at the end. He does. Uh, by bullet, the Bullet king. through the head. Yeah. Yep. Uh, it was so, so good. <laughs> you know, 
it i loved it it did feel just like a complete i just loved this rip on uh hydra it was so good. Absolutely. we The whole bit of, we aren't a joke, no matter what it says on social media. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, before he get, takes the bullet to his head. After failing in their mission, they got beaten by the Guardians it of the Globe. It was also uh, the slightly high, slightly uh, lispy sort was. of act <laughs> voice that, that he did as well, mm -hmm. which I really, really liked. Um, as I say, I, I just loved this moment. It was so yeah. much fun. Really, really good fun. Uh, the other thing I really liked about this moment as well with Ross is him explaining uh, his origin story to the Guardians of the Globe, <laughs> yeah. uh, where he's got this very basic origin story that can just be glossed over really quickly and goes, is that okay? Can I join now? Am I able to join? It? Can, I, can I come and stay and live here? <laughs> can I be part of your team now? That's it. Um, he obviously read it off the back of a cereal box was kind of the uh, the level of detail he went into. Uh, really uh, good. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So I, I wonder, is he going to become a member of the Guardian of the Globe or will they find him, uh, find him so. out pretty quickly or not? I don't know. I hope but, so. Uh, I, I think it's a lot of fun that we're getting this uh, this uh, this interesting character who doesn't even know how to be human um and has only just arrived as a new member of this uh, of this group. Absolutely. And then our final twist of the episode. Once again, post credit scenes in every episode of this yeah. season of Invincible. You'll see them in the other two episodes that are coming out in the next couple of weeks as well. Absolutely. So make sure yes. you don't turn off before the credits go. Oh, um, point five. Mm -hmm. Angstrom. <laughs> yes. Angstrom Levy. So I now understand something that Chris was trying to tell me last week. Okay. So in the comic books, there is one Angstrom Levi who can travel between dimensions. Okay? That's what he tried to tell me last week. What I understand now is by the end of last episode, there is only one, one. Angstrom yeah. Levi. He's pulled everybody from uh, all the other versions of himself and now contains all of their knowledge. And there is only one yeah. Angstrom Levi. So I think that's what Chris was trying to say last week. And I just didn't get it out of him. I didn't, I didn't uh, probably interrogate the, the, uh, the information enough uh, for me to get that out of him. But it makes sense. He is the one that now has all the knowledge of all the information from all the other Angstrom Levi's from all the other dimensions. And in this episode, in this post credit scene, he's in another dimension with a Mark who has been captured, who has been captured. And more importantly, who did join with with Omni Man and Omni Man is dead. Yes. So Angstrom Levi has now found a dimension where they did beat Omni Man and has found uh, what they did. He's gotten the plan uh, from that dimension as for how they took out Omni Man. Yeah, I love the fact that we see a female Cecil and Donald as mm -hmm. well here. They really do look like exactly the same, except a wig <laughs> yeah, on was. them. But... Yeah, it was really good. Uh, but yes, I guess this is his vengeance. Uh, against Mark. And it is kind of the interesting thing, I think, with uh, Angstrom Levy, because his goal was to sort of cure the world. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm not a bad guy. I have, you know, kind of almost pure intentions Absolutely. here. But the accident at the end of episode one here of season two mm -hmm. just um, has corrupted the life out of him yeah. uh, in the sense that He's looking for pure revenge. Mm -hmm. It's not against Omni Man, though. This is against Mark. It's against both of them, but it's, it's because of that accident. You know, mm -hmm. he is committed to destroying Invincible for what he did. Yes. You know, not only in terms of the disfiguration, which he mm -hmm. seems to have kind of like put over a massive hoodie to, yeah. to cover it up, yeah. but also, uh, because of what that plan entailed, which was to find all the technologies mm -hmm. for curing cancer, climate change, all this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. the best of the different dimensions yeah. in order to advance um, and, you know, create galactic peace in a sense yeah and, and also bring it back to the prime dimension fix everything in the prime dimension and then start spreading it back out that philanthropic goal that he had to spread it all out across all the other dimensions after he got it to yeah. the prime dimension uh, which he can't uh, do now and that merging of all the brains all the minds of all the other ancient levi's has left him with the knowledge of what omni man did killing thousands and thousands of people related to and friends of Angstrom Levi and all the other dimensions. Yeah. So, uh, so he's been corrupted yeah, by all that knowledge. But as well, there is, you know, to my mind, it's not entirely, but it's also a singular focus on Mark, you know? Yeah, because yeah, you I see get it that. where he, you know, he comes into the chamber where Mark has been captured mm -hmm. and 
it's the glee that he can't hurt anyone anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, yes, he also wants to go after Omni Man because he knows what he's done, but he also wants to go after his son, even though at least in the dimension where the accident happened, his son didn't join him. Mm-hmm. You know, it's yeah. almost like you're going after the wrong mark yeah. <laughs> in yeah. in the wrong dimension. Because there is just that one line right at the end as he leaves where he turns to uh, Cecil and says to him, um, punish him for everything his father did. You have him in your uh, yeah. in your grasp right now. Now you can take it out on him. So he's telling him to take their reven- revenge out on that that dimension's version of Mark, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Good stuff, but another interesting build-up of this character of Angstrom Levi uh, as he starts to become, I guess, at least this this season's uh, bigger bad at the moment as it starts out. It could be all resolved by episode four, but uh, but right yeah. now it does seem to be building up um, to a big, a big showdown as he learns all this information that he could take out Mark with. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent stuff. Any notes about the episode? Anything else you want to talk about about the episode, John? Yeah, I, it's just one of the things I, I noticed uh, from your podcast last week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you didn't mention about the return of Donald. So uh, we, we didn't do see Donald effectively in blowing himself up after having Omni Man's hand around his spinal cord. And mm-hmm. um, so definitely dead. Yet we do see him again at the side of Cecil. Yes. Uh, and we see again here uh Donald uh doing his thing um in with Cecil. So Yes. How I, did I not notice it last week? Because it was on the yeah. previously on at the beginning where we had Donald killing himself um with Omni Man in the house. Uh and then we saw him in the episode, but this episode, much more focus on it. Um we see Debbie uh, seeing him alive there. Debbie yeah, was across exactly. the other side of the road. She knows he died in that explosion, questions it. And Donald seems to not understand no, he doesn't. that he's dead and back again. Yeah. So and Cecil's kind of like, shh, don't tell him. Yeah, no, <laughs> or something exactly. Like that, so yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yes. That's uh, why is Cloning Donald coming technology, back? Technology, <laughs> I would say. Yeah. Why is Donald coming back? Hence uh, the dodgy wig moment? on the one in uh, the other dimension. It, yeah, possibly, <laughs> possibly. Um, but yeah, why is Donald back, and why is he able to come back, and why does he not know that he died? Uh, last maybe season. Donald is the key to the destruction of Omni Man. He just keeps on coming. Maybe that's it. Coming just back. The, the the way to beat Omni Man is to never die, I guess, or yeah. to die and come back. I guess that, exactly. that might be it. But I just yeah, it's uh, it's it's one of those things. As we said uh, at the beginning of this podcast, so much goes on in these episodes that uh, we're going to miss bits and pieces uh, of it. But um, but yeah, I, I, I'm surprised we forgot to mention that uh, Donald had come back from the dead uh, last week. But uh, really important here. I did noticed this week uh robert kirkman had um had commented on a fan's uh, post about this on twitter they put up a picture going hang on a second did i just see donald in episode one and uh and kirkman just responded with oops <laughs> as if <laughs> as if it was a mistake of the animators putting him back in in the first episode but not a mistake this is part of uh, of his character uh here it seems so we'll probably learn uh, something about donald in the future of the show i guess right yeah good yeah. stuff excellent just one note I completely forgot to mention when I was recording with John um, that we really should have mentioned. Uh, Aquaria, the Queen of Atlantis, is played by Tatiana Maslany, who we uh, covered right here on our podcast uh, all about uh, She-Hulk, when she played the main character, uh, Jennifer Walters, there over on She-Hulk. So uh, really cool uh, to hear her here in, in the episode. I, I noticed it while we were uh, watching the episode, but completely forgot to mention it in our notes uh, for this episode. But great to have her back. Absolutely love Tatiana Maslany. That's it, I think, for our discussion about uh, about Invincible Season 2, Episode 2. Thanks, John, for joining us for this one. It's no very, problem very at good all. Very good to jump in. Uh, so, Derek, what are your overall thoughts for this second episode? In about six hours, I lose my virginity to a fish. I don't, by the way, uh, fellow <laughs> Guardians. Um, no. I'm just recounting the the title of the episode absolutely absolutely no i really like this um there was some great stuff in this episode i really like how they've continued to draw a storylines for mark from what happened with omni man right back to episode one when he killed garden of the globe the impact that it's having on mark in his life right now um everything seems to be connected to it still right everything that's going on in mark's life is still surrounding those actions of Omni Man in season one. And of course it would be. Um, it, it just it, it makes a lot of sense, but it's really well written, really interestingly uh, brought to life on screen. And some great comedy moments that we have in here. Yeah. You know, even the idea 
from obviously from the title of the episode um, that Mark thinks he could possibly have to go and marry uh, a fish like woman uh, underneath uh, underneath the earth in the sea uh, that's possibly the pay that he has to make for his father's choices um, I thought that was really funny uh, and really a really interesting choice for how the series is written so uh, another great episode some really interesting build dates there with uh, with Dr. Angstrom with this um, shape-shifting Martian and him joining the Guardians of the Globe Def- yeah, definitely. and of course the Lizard League was also a great fun but again with this show having the storyline of what's going on with samantha and her parents you know that's something that you wouldn't see in in other shows last week we talked about debbie and her experience of mourning and loss and anger yeah. and how that was treated on the show really interesting and very different for even an adult um a, an adult animated show uh here this these conversations that are going on between Samantha and her parents, uh, very different and very yeah. interesting for uh, this type of animated show. So yeah, great episode. Looking forward to next week. How about yourself, John? What do you think overall of, of this episode? Yeah, I really like this episode. Again, just developing on from the first episode, I'd give this uh, four fish fingered out of five. I mean, fish fingers out of five. <laughs> I almost choked in my water there, John. <sighs> Excellent. <laughs> Like I, I really enjoyed sort of that central thrust, and I, I of Mark dealing with Omni Man. I'm mm-hmm. really still enjoying that. Um, I just loved all the additional fun bits around it from Doctor Seismic returning. I think Russ Livingston and his awkwardness in yes. uh, with the sh- with the, the the Martian inside having to deal with this new surrounding that is called Earth and all their customs. Uh, the Lizard League was just hilarious. I just couldn't stop laughing uh, about that. I just thought the voice acting made that little scene. It was, very cool. uh, it was yeah. so good. Um, yeah, I, you know, everything is just fantastically done here. I'm really, really enjoying it. And I, I think, you know, with Angstrom Le- Levy, you know, I just get the sense of a really, really good nemesis here mm-hmm. for Mark. Yeah. Um, and I just can't wait to see how that plays. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, uh, four fish fingers out of five. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I think with all the knowledge that he's getting from all the different dimensions and pulling it all together in a grand plan to take out Mark, it'll be really interesting to see how that plays out uh, as the season goes on. Excellent stuff. We have some feedback in on our first episode of Invincible Season 2, John. Uh, first up, we got an email in from Coffee and Vodka who says, Greetings, fellow mind-melded defenders. A good start for a long overdue Season 2. It was nice to see that he remains anything but invincible, <laughs> especially going up against the Mauler Bros which one would have thought were easily beaten the other dimensional father and son team up made for a great fake out at the beginning of the episode all the characters especially Debbie seem to be fully formed rather than just there to motivate Mark my one hope is that Kirkman stops seeing this fantastic show as a side project to his many Walking Dead projects and steps up production in the meantime, looking forward to the rest of the apps as well as your coverage of them. 4.5, two face molars, boorish bullies, and pissed off pacifists out of five. Peace and take care. Coffee and vodka. Excellent stuff. Great uh, ratings there, coffee and yeah, vodka. Thanks, again. coffee and vodka. Yeah, yeah I, the, the fake out from uh, episode one was really good. Because um, I was, you know, you, you go into it and you're just going. Oh, okay. That's, that's very, that's different from what I thought was going to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was really good. And just then linking that into Angstrom Levy there is also really good because I liked how that continued over just as that little snippet at the end of this episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was just really good as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've got some great news for you, Coffee and Vodka, in regards to uh, Mr. Kirkman. He's no longer involved in the TV shows. Absolutely he gets royalties and he has the executive producer credit on The Walking Dead, but he's not involved in that universe. Hasn't been for quite a long time actually because of a court case that he took against AMC after about season three of the show. So um, so he ha- he was involved over there. Of course, they're based on his comic books. He does get royalties, but uh, he is entirely focused on his comic book projects and Invincible. And even better news, the show has been confirmed for a third season, which means the animation studio are already working on the third season at the moment. So Excellent. even though we're getting four episodes this year, four episodes next year, hopefully early next year uh, for this season two. Season three is already in the works. So uh, so don't worry, lots of Invincible left to come, thankfully. 
and in much more rapid succession as well, which is great. Yeah. Thanks, Coffee and Vodka. Uh, over on Facebook, John Bucket says, Welcome back, Invincible. I did not expect Mark to fall in with Cecil so quickly. Mm. Yeah, that was an interesting choice, wasn't it? Um, you know, I think it's kind of him trying to prove himself that yeah. he can work for Cecil. And part of it is if he goes and works for the person who was his, for- his father's former employer and does the heroic thing that means to Mark that he's not like his father. Exactly. I think that's part of it. For and Mark. I think, you know, the, the, the reverse of that is true is that Mark may expect or think he's fallen back in with Cecil. Mm-hmm. I think Cecil has very different ideas that he has. And, um, you know, this yeah. is still a test bed very much for Cecil. Mm-hmm. Possibly any sniff of something slightly omni, then, mm-hmm. you know, Cecil could be a very different proposition um, That's true. than Mark thinks. That's true. Good stuff. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. We uh, also got some feedback in from Dr. Bob Phillips, who says, I did not see that coming. Roughly sums up my view of this episode, but with admiration, not regret. Biggest highlights were the alternate style and gender expression of the Maulers in the multidimensional mauling massacre and the in-credit styling of a survivor Ahsoka style. But I also love the sobering effect of child injury on a drunk parent and still can't cope with C-cell as the mispronunciation of Cecil. <laughs> Very good, Dr. Absolutely. Uh, finally, Seashells, seashells on the seashore, Cecil. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah, two completely mis- different pronunciations of uh, of Cecil and Cecil. Uh, thanks, Dr. Bob. Uh, finally, Dr. Bob says, I have a question. Angstrom Levi, is that a reference to the measurement of astronomical size and Schitt's Creek as well? <laughs> it could possibly be. <laughs> I, think I think Angstrom is. Yeah, Angstrom. Um, but uh, Invincible is um, quite an old comic at this stage. been around for a long, long time. So probably not a reference to uh, Eugene and Dan Levy. No, probably not. Probably not. But but you never know. It could be. They, they could have picked up Eugene Levy. He's been around for a very long time. <laughs> Maybe that's it. Thanks so much, Dr. Bob, for your feedback. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Bob, uh, for the feedback. And thank you, fellow Guardians, for all those thoughts. Really good stuff. Absolutely. And thanks once again for joining me, John. Uh, Hopefully we'll have Chris back for our discussion next week on uh, Season 2, Episode 3, This Missive, This Machination. Oh, I wanted to say that so that then... I wasn't here, and it'd be really confusing. (laughs) We can always have you back on for the third episode. No, just the fourth, I think. Okay, okay, we'll see. Or maybe the eighth we'll in see 2024. How it works out. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see how it works out, John, but we are covering loads of other stuff. We've still got the season finale of Loki season two uh, coming up, which also came out today on uh, Disney+. Plus. And this weekend, we're going back to the cinema to watch The Marvels, the, uh, ne- the 34th movie Yay. in the MCU. I think so, yeah. yeah. I'm very excited about it. The reviews have been really good. And uh, some of my favourite characters in there. Really excited yeah, to see uh, Miss Marvel back on screen. Nick Fury back on screen. Captain, Captain Marvel. Marvel. Yeah. yeah. And Monica Rambeau. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, really excited no to see them all on screen together. No vigilante intended. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Good stuff. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be back with you next time. Yes, thanks so much, fellow Guardians, for joining us. Uh, great to be on this episode of Invincible. Uh, in the meantime, and until Chris returneth uh, to the podcast, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> keep watching, keep listening, and of course, keep being invincible. Absolutely. Bye. Bye.